All right, so this is a nice technique for making uh, tileable textures out of uh, existing meshes you might have on hand. So we're going to be using uh, 3D Go's voxel uh, system for this, along with instancing. So let's go to the voxel tab. And the way that I'm going to do this is we start with, uh, let's just insert an object, you know, um, a primitive, just random sphere for now. And then we go down uh, to the up to the instancing tool. And what this allows us is that it's going to take our volume and make an instanced clone out of it. So if we do that now, you can see the instance pop up down here. And we move it up, say, 200 units. You know, the exact number doesn't matter, but you, it should be easy to remember. So. Um, you can use it later when you bake your normals. I'll, I'll show you that later. So you move it 200 units up, um, then you make another instance. You can see they're all grouped under the master volume. Then we set this one in minus 200. Oops, my keyboard was wrong there. There we go, minus 200. Then we do yet another one, which is set this one to zero again. Now we put this one at 200, and yet another one where we once again go minus, minus 200. So now we have a grid of instances, 4x4. Four four. So what you can see here is that if we edit the master volume, like so, this is going to propagate over to all the other instances in the scene. And what's cool as well is that this is not only editing the existing object that, uh, that's in the scene, because the way that 3D code works is that volumes are essentially the whole world, and you fill them with little voxels, you know, or 3D pixels, is what you can think of them as. So if I were to insert more meshes into it, say, another uh, primitive, like, let's make a cube this time, we just put it in position, hit enter to insert it. You can see how that is added into the other instances. So you should already be able to tell how this can be used to make tileable, uh, tileable textures. So if we just clear this layer, uh, we didn't delete anything, we just emptied the volume. And let's take some proper meshes now instead of primitives. So the merge tool lets you take uh, an object, an OBJ file or anything, and uh, bring that into the scene and you know, voxelize it. So I will grab my planks. These are some planks I made from, um, you know, I just uh, sculpted them on the ZBrush and uh, exported each subtool. So let's grab plank one, start with that. Now, uh, plank one disappears all the way up in here. So um, we need to just center to bound center because my, uh, when I exported it, the uh, things were a bit off center. So we just, you know, center pivot and Set this to zero, zero, and zero. So now it's centered in the origo. And if we hit enter now, uh, it asks us if we want to keep this. Just say yes. You can see the planks appear. We did miss the mark by a bit. Um, you know, there, there's some overlapping. But if we you know, pay attention to the grid, we can see that it's this is roughly the halfway point between those two. So if we just undo that, Scale it down until we meet that point on the grid. There we go. Easy as that. So, let's uh, bring in plank number two. Oh, let's just center it again for good's sake. And we move it up like this. Let's get some offset in here so it looks a bit more interesting. See? Starts adding up like this. So we just keep doing this. Plank 3. If your object is very high poly, uh, loading can take quite a while. So uh, I recommend that you decimate your objects before you send them over to 3D code because you really don't need clean topology for this because it disregards it anyway. It just turns it into voxels. So if you were to bring in like a 7 million mesh, you would sit here and stare at the loading screen for 30 seconds. So don't do that. That's a bad. That's a bad idea. 
generally you would never want to export super dense meshes like that anyway, or even for X normal. Decimation is key, that's your friend. Um, let's see. Which mesh was that on? Was it on? One, two, three, yeah, four. It's not that important, you know, because you could always just do, you know, if you have like me, um, given it, you know, unique sides on each side, you can just flip them around like this and do whatever. So, you know, you can get a lot of mileage out of, you know, you could just use a single rock for all of this. Not to mention that for, uh, you know, for each of them, you could also simply, you know, sculpt on them using the, the voxel sculpting tools because, you know, 3D code is just like ZBrush, it's the sculpting app. So, well, it's a lot more than just a sculpting app, but, you know, you can certainly do it. So, you know, if you want to do some changes, you can certainly do that, and that's also going to propagate to all the other instances. So, for example, you know, if things don't line up properly, you know, you can just grab the move tool, which I can't remember where it's right now. There it is. You know, you just ease things in so they like they fit together better. Uh, things get a little blurry. Uh, I think it's because I use a pretty bad alpha. I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, this one's right. This is this one's pretty linear, so it shouldn't cause as much distortion. And let's see, like here, for example. Ah, screw it. It's just a demo. I probably want to be a bit more precise than I am right now. Um, let's move back to the merge tool. There we go. You know, so just keep 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 on trucking. Uh, you know, and you can very quickly, you know, just build yourself some really nice, you know, modular, well, not modular, tiling, uh, tiling textures out of this. Yeah, this is like brilliant for, this is especially brilliant for, you know, things that naturally tile, like say, um, say bricks, you know, it's great for bricks, planks like this. Um, you know, you could also do things like, you know, rocks and sand, pebbles. Uh, you could probably even, I don't, don't think you could do grass, um, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, not a lot of possi possibilities. And I actually prefer this, prefer this over the 2.5D canvas method in ZBrush, where you, you know, you drop, the, you drop it to the 2.5D canvas and you, you know, tile it with the tilde key, because, you know, once you've dropped it, it's it's baked. You know, it's it's a very destructive uh, it's a very destructive workflow. So with this one, you can actually you know, as I showed you, you can go back and edit things after the fact, and you know, you're not not really limited by your history as much as you are in ZBrush. I really want ZBrush to get instancing. That would just be freaking amazing. Maybe ZBrush five. You know, say they will rewrite the whole thing. Get a 64 bit. It really needs catch up. Alright, so yeah, I'm just, you know, chugging along. Oh, well, this is the same mesh. Well, let's just do what I showed you earlier just flip it, change the scale. You, know, you can get a lot of mileage out of that, especially considering you'll probably end up putting a you know, a color map on top of it afterwards, so... You know, don't worry too much about, you know, using every single unique mesh you get. You know, as I said, you can probably get away with just using one. I mean, I'm not being super accurate about, you know, making sure the vol you know you can see there's a bit of a weird overlap here you know how i placed it but that doesn't honestly doesn't matter as long as you know you fill as long as you fill enough to do a square you know so, yeah you know there may be flaws to this method that i haven't run across yet because i haven't really used it extensively i you know i just tried it out and i was like oh great this works wonderfully you know, I, I like this workflow, um, but, you know, some limitations may apply that I haven't come across yet, so keep that in mind.
and, you know, leave a comment on the video if you have any complaints or discover any issues or new amazing ways of doing things. Oh, come on. Um, I haven't had coffee yet, so I'm a bit, I'm a bit reduced. So I tend to miss my manipulator a lot. A bit clumsy right now. And by the way, I am using the demo version of 3D Code, which is you know the the free version you get after your 30-day trial has expired. And you know it works wonderfully. You know there's like pretty much all the features you need are there. Only thing that you know they limit you on how m certain things you can export. Um, some of the painting uh, features, which which is a shame because those are wonderful. Um, and um, a couple other things, you know, they limit you on texture resolution and such, but um, most of the important features like, you know, this voxel tools and the, the retopology, which is, you know, amazing, um, those are all included, you know, there's no limitation to those. So if you don't have 3D code, get it. It's a very good tool and it's going to be, you know, it's going to grow into an industry standard just like ZBrush did. It's not, I don't even have any doubt about that. UV tools are great too, you know. If you don't like doing UVs in Maya, 3D code is pretty sweet. The the sculpting is not as good as ZBrush, I think. Uh, oops. ZBrush has just it's hard to describe, hard to put your finger on it. It has a really good feel to it. The brushes and the you know snappiness of it. Uh, maybe it's just because I'm so used to it, you know, but the um, yeah, I'm not too I'm not I'm not huge on the, the sculpting tools for uh, for uh, 3D code. I just everything feels a bit blobby to me. And I've had some performance issues, but that's probably just because I'm doing things wrong. Oh, I just like the same mesh, that's silly. Yeah, pretty much every other feature in 3D Code is amazing. So, it should definitely be part of your workflow. And as I said, it's free. And even if, you know, and when you decide to buy the whole version, it's ridiculously cheap. I think it's, what, three, four hundred for a, for a professional license. Uh, it's probably more for studios, but, you know, if you're a freelancer or whatever, it's like, just a couple of hundred, and student version is like a hundred dollars, which is like nothing. You know, that's like, like what? That's like two Xbox games. You know, you can totally like, can totally save up for that. Uh, I'm broke at the moment, so I haven't invested in it yet, but certainly will down the line. I love this program. All right, I think I've covered the entire 200 by 200 square now, but. Just gonna be on the safe side. This sucks having like a little hole poke through your mesh. I'm just getting sloppy. You know, it's like uh, I don't want to keep you guys all day. All right, this is probably good. So, uh, what we do then? I can't exactly remember this step. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, you need to uninstance all so they become separate volumes, I believe. And then you... See, is this a merge down? No. You need to merge them. Um, son of a bitch. Ah! Well, here we go. Merge visible. That was easy. Just like Photoshop. It 
If your computer is not that powerful, uh, you should be careful. Because this can very quickly become heavy as hell and crash a computer. So, uh, now I just need to remember where the export function is. They tend to hide it. Um, yeah, because this is a, this is what I'm talking about. This is the free version, so you can't you don't have all the export functions that we normally have. Just need to. But there is totally a export function in here somewhere. I'll probably edit this out uh, while I'm hunting for the, the the tool. Okay, so it seems that. Um, I was mistaken about the export functions um, not being completely locked out. Uh, it seems that either I assumed wrongly or that they've changed the how it works in the recent version. So what I do is what I had to do is that I the the, the previous planks I did on poly count was done in uh, 3.5, uh, not 3.7, which I just used. So I just loaded this uh, thing up here and went to export. Uh, export object and save it as plank demo. All right, and it asks to reduce the polygon. So I'm not. I don't want to put three million polygons inside of Maya. So uh, I'm thinking. Um, oh, let's see. Yeah, fifty is probably good. Just for demonst demonstration purposes. Alright, there we go. And we switch to Maya. And just do a clean scene. And import our plank demo. And wait. Um, there we go. It's down here. And it's huge because my scale is all off. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty gigantic. All right, let's, uh, let's change the settings on the camera. If you have a huge object, just change the far clip plane to something really high and it should be fine. You can change the viewport to 2.0 because it handles large amounts of polygons much better than the standard viewport. All right, and let's just put this in the center. Or, you know, something close to it. All right, so here's our planks. You can see, you know, even with designation, it preserved details pretty decently. Um, you could probably do better than this, but, what we do now is that we create a polygon plane and remember that we offset it by 200 by 200 so we gotta change the polyplane plane size to 200 and 200 um, thinking my scale is off, this does not look right because um, that's strange because last time I did it the um, Size of it matched up with no problem. I'm thinking I did something wrong somewhere. Um, let's give it a try though. Let's see what happens. Uh, but yeah, I suppose this is. Oh wow! I went completely overkill on that, didn't I? Yeah, no, that was no reason for me to. There's no reason for me to go that large. No, I'm 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 wrong. This is fine. I'm just being silly. So, okay, we take this plane and let's, you know, bake our normals with it and see how that works. Transfer maps, um, clear all, remove all our maps. All right. Let's, um, yeah, sure, let's just bake it here. Normal. Uh, Plank double normal. All right. Uh, Targa because it's nice. Um, all settings are fine. 
512 by 512. That's good. Yeah, nothing wrong here. Excellent. Uh, target meshes, polyplane, source meshes, plank mesh, and let's do this. Oh, okay, here we go. Seems to be done. So, uh, did, let's see if I have... Okay, I did not connect the maps to shader, so let's just... Sign a blin and find our normals. Actually, first of all, let's just take a look at our normals, see if it looks nice. Alright. And see, here you go. Um, bit of a gray in the back, in, uh, back here. Uh, you know. That's just because it was empty space. Uh, unlike unlike X normal, Maya doesn't just fill in the normal uh, neutral normal color if it misses. So, what does X normal do that? I'm not actually certain. I might be talking out of my ass. Uh, oh boy. All right. Let's navigate my giant network of folders. See, here you go. Here's our normal map. Baked from the thing, and oops. We go here and start tiling it, three by three. Uh, you can see that it does not tile perfectly, so um, my calculations somewhere were wrong. Uh, yeah, as I said, I've only done this once before, and the Maya 2 3D code units matched up perfectly, so. Somewhere along the way, I must have done a mistake in throwing the scale off. But in any case, this is the basics of how the how the workflow is supposed to work. You know, you just take your mesh, line them up in 3D code using the instancer, and um, and then you bake them out. You know, you should get a perfectly tile of a normal if everything goes right. I think this is weird. I'm thinking I might have maybe have some rotation on it. That's really strange. Well, anyway, this is a general idea. I hope you hope you learn from it, even though the results were far from spectacular.